I'm really happy today to welcome Josh Bailey, who's, who's, who's been a really good friend of mine for a long time. And, uh, and he's been a very active uh, leader in the geoscience community. And uh, he's very passionate uh, proponent of, of exploration, as we'll see today. And so we, we, we thought it's a really good opportunity to invite him and, and have a good conversation about the relevance of, of exploration in, in, in our society, and especially in Canada. And what are some of the trends uh, that, that we're seeing recently, uh, discovery trends and, and investment trends. And, um, and yeah, and, and, and he can, he'll give us a bit of an introduction to Xyro, uh, what he's doing uh, with that team to be very innovative and creative in, 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 uh, in addressing these, these exploration uh, trends. And, um, you know, you, since I've known you over 15 years, you've been always very passionate about exploration. And, and uh, um, so where does this passion come from? And so give us a bit of a, your personal background. Uh, how did you end up in exploration? Yeah, right on. So I, it, you know, it seems almost inevitable. I've been kind of thinking that, thinking that question through and, and looking back and, um, so I, I grew up uh, on the Sunshine Coast in BC, where there's really no mining other than gravel quarries. And, uh, um, but we had a fair amount of family history in mining and I grew up around a lot of stories. And so I've been thinking through some of that. Um, I was born in Kino City in the Yukon and uh, both my parents worked, well, I was born in Mayo, which was the neighboring nursing station. Uh, but both my parents worked underground at, for United Kino Hill in the silver mines there. And that was a, a Falconbridge company. So it's kind of funny. That's a um, connection to Sudbury there. Um, and I, I think my mom might have been one of the first underground uh, female miners up there at the time too, which is kind of neat. But, uh, and then, you know, another kind of touch point in my family is my great grandfather during the depression um, developed, he was a carpenter and he developed the Minto gold mine in the Bridge River area of BC. So that's, that's the Braylorn mining district where Talisker Resources is uh, working on a project right now. Um, and, and there's, there's production there right now. Um, he, he built a town site for his miners and it's kind of neat because the, uh, they, they didn't provide any housing. And so all the miners that went in there ended up just squatting all over around in the valley and then, and then working at the mine. But he actually built a town site and a hotel and everything. Um, the mine didn't last very long uh, and, and then that shut down. Um, and then, and then they, they ended up using that town site as a, for a, an internment camp for uh, Japanese Canadians during the war, which is a pretty dark part of Canadian history. But, um, and, then, and then they ended up flooding it for a hydro dam. So you can still see some of the footings of the buildings and stuff under the shallow water there. But anyway, so that was, that's sort of a part of my history there. And then when I was a kid, my, my stepdad, my sister's dad, he was a carpenter and a prospector. And um, like, I remember we drove across Canada when I was probably four. And I think it was probably in the, going through BC, we'd stop at every single bridge. And like a lot of people would go fishing. He, he'd be gold panning in like every river that we went, went over on the way across BC. And so that was um, kind of neat. We learned about, you know, I learned what quartz was and fool's gold and gold and that kind of thing. And then we had this pegmatite outcrop in our yard that had these really big, um, I think it was probably biotite crystals, mica anyways. And we, I remember sitting there peeling off layers of it and kind of looking up th at the sun through it and that kind of thing when I was a kid. And then when I was a teenager, my older brothers are 10 and 12 years older than me. They, uh, they, they were worked as tramp miners and diamond drillers working in camps and that kind of thing. And, um, they had lots of stories, mostly about getting into trouble and stuff when they got back to town from the camps. But, um, but I, you know, I kind of grew up around all those stories and stuff. And then, so, so after high school, I, I moved back to the Yukon. I was, like I said, I grew up in BC mostly. And uh, to get to know my dad, and I was working in restaurants and in the construction work. And um, 
you know, I remember the moment I was, it was at a, there was a Chinese food restaurant um, at the McRae gas station, which is just south of Whitehorse on the Alaska highway. And I was sitting there with my dad and he was explaining to me that like anyone can own the mineral rights. Like anybody can go and stake a claim. It's basically free and you can go out and you can stake the ground. You can have, you can have, you know, a right to explore it and a right to the minerals. And, you know, it's, um, and all you, all you have to do to maintain it is to do work on it. And that really caught my imagination. That was, just seemed like, uh, you know, phenomenal that you could yeah. have that kind of opportunity and make a discovery and that kind of thing. And it really didn't cost you anything. Obviously, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> now you know better. <laughs> and I, so I knew I wanted to work in the bush. And so I, I looked in the yellow pages and just kind of scanning the different businesses. And there was a geological consultant, which was Al Dorgan. Um, and uh, I thought, well, I think geologists work in the woods. So I went and I knocked on his office door and, and it was the middle of the winter. And this was right after uh, Briex. So there was really, the gold industry had been completely decimated and there was really no work or exploration investment, especially, especially in, the, in the territory that time, at that time. And Alice kind of said, well, that's nice, but I don't have anything for you. And then I went back the next Monday and then the next Monday. And then I think he was getting annoyed with me. He said, you know what, give it a couple of months <laughs> and then come back. Because I'd be waiting at his office when he, sh when he showed up there at the in the morning. And uh, anyways, I, uh, uh, there was another group that was, uh, they were claim stakers and line cutters. And I went and uh, knocked on their door as well and they weren't there. But then when I was leaving, there was an office, uh, which was uh, Aurora Geoscience. So this is Mike Power, he was a geophysical consultant. And I, I just kind of knocked on his door just because I saw the sign on the door. Anyways, he humored me for a while and he ended up giving me my first job, which was um, doing working on a, a small hard rock seismic survey and a gravity survey. And then I did some prospecting jobs. Uh, eventually, Al Doherty gave me some work um, and uh, line cutting jobs, soil sampling, prospect, prospecting, staking. And then I did a course over the winter, which was sort of three hours a week in the evenings. Uh, it was a prospecting course. There was two of them um, through the uh, Yukon Chamber of Mines. And, um, and I really enjoyed that. And um, there was a woman in that course, Anne Bordelow, who, uh, you know, I got to be good friends with, and she does logistics and camp management and that kind of thing. And uh, she got me a really good job the following summer where I was out in camp the entire summer. But she said, I'll give you this work on the condition that you apply to university. And so I was like, oh, God. <laughs> But uh, so, I, so I applied to university um, and uh, I'd actually met Steve Piercy uh, that summer uh, or sorry, that, that winter. Uh, and uh, he, 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 uh, he was study, doing his PhD at uh, UBC, but he's from Newfoundland, obviously. Lots of people on the call know him. And I, he, I was sort of like kicking around, do I go to Newfoundland or do I go to UBC? And anyways, I ended up going to Newfoundland. I did my undergrad there and really enjoyed it, worked for the government survey uh, once, managed to get through that without a student debt, which was pretty nice opportunity. And then I came to, um, and, uh, and my daughter was born while I was there. And, uh, and then, so I graduated and this was 2002 and there was really no work. I must've sent out like 200 resumes, but there was a funded, um, master's program at Laurentia. Um, and that was with uh, uh, Falcon Bridge on their Thayer Lindsley mine. And uh, um, so I came to Sudbury and um, did my master's at Laurentia. And then uh, coming out of that, there was a job at Walbridge. And I worked, you know, with you for 13 years there. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, um, I, I thought I want to get back to prospecting. I want to get back to 
owning something instead of being yeah. an employee. And I made the jump to join Shastri and now we're building Xero. So yeah, pursuing your passion of, of uh, early stage grassroots exploration and that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so kind of staying on um, a little bit on the personal level. So uh, yeah, I mean, obviously you, you've you seen a lot of change at Laurentian over the years. Uh, you know, back in, in 2004, I guess the department was very different than it is now. And, and um, now, you know, without trying, you know, without going too much into the politics behind it or, or all that, but, uh, you know, it, it kind of, we can't really avoid the topic of, of Laurentian. So where do you stand with that? And, and, and what do you see for, for the future of the geology department itself? Yeah, well, I, I mean, this, the university is having a hard time right now, obviously, with uh, restructuring and that kind of thing, which is uh, unprecedented in Canada, I think. And, uh, you know, that's that's a tragic shame, really. Yeah. Um, I, I can't pretend to really understand what's the cause of that or anything else, but I hope I hope they manage to figure that out and restructure and, and come back stronger. But I mean, the 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 uh, the Earth Science Department and the Mineral Exploration Research Center at, at Laurentian are phenomenal. I mean, what a what a great place to study uh, economic geology in a yeah. in a hundred and thirty year old mining town. Yeah, no better place than that. Yeah, for sure. You know, and you, got, you got nickel copper PGMs in Sudbury. A couple hours away, you got gold in Timmins. Uh, you know, you got other base metal VMS type stuff. Only a few hours drive away in Quebec and and Timmins. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, I think it's one of the best applied economic geology programs in the world. And, uh, and, the, and then with the metal earth project that they're working on, I mean, the research is phenomenal, right? Yeah. Um, when I was there, I, it was, it was part of the mineral exploration research center. Um, I think I remember that when I was doing my master's, there was four people graduated from their undergraduate one year <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think there was still a couple dozen grad students hanging around and um, so I, it was a great experience and I think um, I don't know this but I suspect that there's a very high employment rate for people coming out of those programs too right yeah well, I think so yeah especially now yeah yeah so I think uh, you know, it's a, it's a great program, and it's it's one of the strengths at the university. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I hope I hope uh, it looks like it's a program that the university is betting on uh, on being the future. You know, once they can. And um, yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah. Well, um... Well, and you've also done a lot of volunteering, which I, I haven't mentioned at the beginning, but yeah, I mean, uh, you and I have been involved in the, in the PDAC's SIMU program as well, and, and a lot of things like that, and, and your involvement at the OPA as well. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit and, and, and the importance of that? Well, I think, you know what, the best, the best examples of, I think, the power of, of volunteering is is probably Ed and Ruth Dubicki, who I know are, yep. are sitting in on this meeting and listening to it, you know? Absolutely. And, like, it's phenomenal. I think, you know, there's so many things that go on in the community that just wouldn't happen without them specifically, but or without people participating in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, Gem and Mineral Show, um, the, uh, the, the Sudbury Prospectors, you know, and I know they're involved in all kinds of other stuff too. I, I think it's really important. I think it's, uh, but I also think it's a really fulfilling thing to do. And, um, and, and I've met a lot of people, like it's terrific for networking and building relationships, which is really, you know, critical for uh, careers and that kind of thing. Um, and, and just learning about the industry also. And like one of the one, you know, I, 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 you know, I've, had, I've worked with lots of young people too, and I always encourage them to get involved in things like this because, um, you know, when you're, when you're volunteering for an organization, you can approach people that are in very senior leadership positions in the industry and interact with them on a almost level leader to leader type basis, you know, and it's a, that's a heck of an opportunity. Yeah. 
um, you know, instead of just asking them for a job or to mentor you or something like that. And you never know where some of those connections lead, right? So, yeah. I've, I've always enjoyed these these, these semi two weeks uh, of uh, student industry, you know, exploration workshop. Um, yeah, it's always organized in Sudbury, and it's it's so much fun because you have 25, 30 students from all over Canada coming together, and and uh, you can see these all these different backgrounds of you know some universities are obviously stronger on on oil and gas, and and so so those guys may not ever have seen. Canadian shield rocks, and then then you have some other people from, you know, BC who's, who's who've gotten some totally different geology background, and so it's really good to get everybody together. And and there's always uh, it's it's really good to see in the industry how much uh, how much support there is for these kind of things. You know, in kind support, and 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 a lot of people giving their time to, um, uh, yeah, basically. Uh, um, interact with the students and, and, and so this, what they're getting out of this those two weeks are so jam-packed for the students and it's just amazing how much they get get out of it you know they they get to interact with some of the some of the leaders in the industry and, and they're getting to go to all kinds of field trips and underground mines and so yeah i think i think these are these are amazing uh initiatives that we we need to continue fostering and of course, it's it's a bit difficult now with uh, you know with COVID. Two of these, two of these two new years already had to be canceled, but uh, yeah, we're, we'll we'll try to do whatever we can to to keep these uh, things going. And then uh, there's some, there's there's something funny about our industry because it is like intellectual property is so important, and it is a little bit secretive, and you know it's extremely competitive, but it's still a it seems like it's very collaborative too, you know. And I wonder if there's something about it, us being uh, kind of price takers in the market, you know, like we can't, metal prices are what they are, you know? Yeah. So I wonder if there's something about that that leads to, you know, it's an industry that does, I think, collaborate a lot across between different companies and supporting things like that. So that's yeah. kind of, yeah. Yeah, so I know you have a few slides uh, to share with us on the sort of the, Global, well, mainly Canadian exploration trends and, and investment trends. So, yeah. yeah so I, I've I've been, you know, my interest in this, you know, started a long time ago, and I've kind of been tracking numbers around investing and and different trends. And most of what I'm going to show you today is other people's work, and I'm trying to reference people where I can and stealing it pretty shamelessly. Um, but hopefully, it's hopefully it's uh, interesting and useful for. For people and uh, I'll just share my screen here. Okay, we're good, eh? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I've got a number of slides here, and um, I thought I would just lead with my uh, conclusions, which is, you know, here's here's uh, this is from S and P Global Market Intelligence. It's part of the free report they put out every year around the PDAC. And you can see the annual uh, metals price index. So that's like a basket of all metal prices, some kind of factor they calculated. And then total um, worldwide expiration uh, expenditures. And, you know, just the most striking thing I can see here is that, you know, the, the, the investment in the industry really bottomed out in 2015, 2016, since the highs of the last cycle. And um, oh, I think I got a pointer here. And uh, but what you can prices have pretty much climbed since 2015, you know, in aggregate. But the investment in exploration has stayed pretty flat. And um, you know, I think that eventually one of two things is going to happen: either the metal prices are going to come down, or the amount of money that ever, you know the world spends to find more metals is going to come up drastically. And yeah. Um, I'm biased, of course, but I don't think the metal prices are, are going to pull all the way back before that happens. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the mining sector is really not a very efficient market here. So you think, uh, you know, is this because there's a lot of competing investment opportunities now with cannabis and some other you know, tech stocks and those kind of things? Is it sort of a generational thing that, uh, you know, younger investors don't really understand or appreciate mining? 
or you know a combination of those of those or is it uh maybe the, the mining industry has done a poor job of actually creating value and, and proving up that we were, we're worth the investment. I, I think it's all of those things. I, you know, I, I do think that, um, and I kind of touched on this later, but I do think that the world's been preoccupied by, uh, you know, the internet world. And, and, you know, part of what I want to discuss is that the physical world actually still matters. And, uh, you know, we're seeing that and I'll run through some examples. But you know the the mining industry, yeah, it destroyed a lot of value through the last cycle at the end of the last cycle, with uh, you know and 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 I think in terms of producers, have you know spent that time in the last ten years now, uh, cleaning up balance sheets and really being more disciplined, and and everyone seems cautious to dip their toes back into it. But I think I think you know I kind of look at it like the elastic is being pulled back. And eventually, it's going to it's going to snap. And and um, when some of the mainstream investor interest turns its eye towards the mining industry, you know what's what's clear is that the mining industry is a very small market, and so it, it can become quite manic when that happens. And uh, so, anyways, I'm optimistic about our sector, and I, I'll, I'll go through it a little bit more here. Uh, this is a slide I always like to show when I'm when I'm looking at these things, and um, you know I, I got this quote from my my namesake on the on the right hand side here, and this phrase uh, "hewers of wood and drawers of water" is something that Canada's sort of been struggling with ever since before Confederation, and we have this sort of longstanding inferiority complex about our resource based economy, and you still see that in the narrative. And, you know, but the reality is, is that we do have a resource-based economy. It's a, it's an important and proud part of our heritage and, and we should pay attention to it. And so the, what, what these are is these are pictures from the, from the House of Commons in Ottawa. They're cornerstone uh, uh, carvings in the uh, foyer of the House of Commons. And they show the farmer, the forester, the fisherman and the miner. And then there's there's lots of beaver statues too, and I think it's just a kind of a neat reminder that um, you know our resource-based economy is really important, and you know manufacturing and trade can add, you know they add value and and the financial sector you know is a phenomenal huge part of our our economic our economy, um, but all of that's built on, on the base of of wealth that's created first with primary resource extraction and, and Canada is a big part of that. And, um, you know, we're not going to just get rich by living on Zoom and, and investing in Apple and Google and, and Facebook and, and Amazon. Um, yeah, and this, this is what I was saying is this, this you know, Friedland gave that talk uh, at, at Roundup there where he called it the revenge of the miners. And, you know, I'm kind of looking at it just like people are waking up again that the physical world is actually an important thing to pay attention to. And you can see that in, uh, we're looking at building a deck this summer, lumber prices have tripled. Yeah. Uh, you can't buy sporting equipment, you can't buy you know, patio furniture, you had the blackouts in Texas, uh, you had that, uh, that poor captain get stuck in the Suez Canal. Um, you know, the, there's the whole narrative about battery metals and, uh, um, and, and, and having a strategic domestic supply for uh, battery metals and rare earths and copper, nickel. Um, you know, the whole Western world has a major infrastructure deficit. You know, most of the infrastructure was built in the, in the depression and then in the post-war period and hasn't been replaced. Um, you know, there's news about semiconductor shortages, um, you know, climate change, good example. Um, you know, we had, uh, we, we saw the effects of, um, you know, blockades on Canada's railway before COVID took the news. Um, you know, vaccine development capacity, PPE manufacturing capacity. And then another big one that I think is, uh, is kind of scary is the just-in-time food production. You know, most of the major cities only have a couple of days of food available within their city and everything's just delivered right on time. And, you know, I think people are really starting to understand now that um, the physical aspects of the supply chain are critical 
And of course, minerals are a big part of that. Um, so this is a, this is a you know a plot here that shows uh, historical exploration expenditures going back pretty much as far as there's data. Um, and then on the right hand side, this is from uh, Richard Shoddy. And then on the right hand side, um, S and P's most you know statistics. So 8.7 billion in exploration uh, last year. Uh, just over half of that is gold. About 20% is copper. Um, you know, one of the things with Xyro is we're kind of mimicking that proportion in our, our own portfolio just to have exposure to, the, to uh, what people are interested in. Uh -huh. um, and, and so that's, uh, you know, one takeaway there. Um, and then importantly, at the bottom, there's 34% of um, global exploration expenditures are by companies that are headquartered in Canada which is pretty enormous. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not only that, we also export an enormous amount of expertise, mining service supply expertise internationally. Um, you know, and, and this is extremely important industry for Canada where we have a lot of competitive advantage. And just some interesting trends here, as you can see that like the, the former Soviet Union and the U.S. really dominated exploration investment until sort of the late 80s. Well, that's, you know, that's the end of the Cold War. So I guess the, each of them probably got more comfortable relying on uh, external sources of metals. Then Canada really started picking up in the 80s. And, and that's with the invention of the flow through um, mineral tax credit idea, which is a, a financial innovation. Um, and then Latin America really, you know, picked up in the '90s and 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 has stayed really strong since. And then and then China has, uh, you know, in the last 15 years, has has taken up a significant market share for investment. I, I assume a lot of that is domestic investment there. Um, and Canada's managed to since the '90s stay pretty steady, Eddie. Um, and it's about, you know, equal with Australia, kind of trading back and forth. Um, so, we're, so we're a huge player internationally. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone on this, this meeting. Um, but, you know, there's a reason Canada punches above its weight in this sector. And it, I think it really starts with the strength of the domestic industry. And, you know, I think it's, it's worth thinking about why has Canada been able to develop such a strong domestic mining industry. Um, and I've kind of boiled it down to sort of three key bits. We got good geology, so four key bits. Um, but I think that's a given. Lots of places have good geology. Um, we've traditionally had this free entry system. So we've, we've got this transverse come first serve, very low cost entry um, approach to um, distributing mineral rights. And I think that that has created a lot of uh, entrepreneurial activity and, um, and, and really you know, generated a culture of people that prospectors and junior mining companies and, and investors. And then I think another piece of that is um, the assessment work system. And you know, we're, you know, personally, we've been looking at uh, mineral properties in the US and in most of the areas down there, you pay a tax every year to maintain your ground. And that's in addition to any work that you do. So in Canada, all you have to do is work the property right. and it's use it or lose it. And then the other key piece of that is you, you have to file that work with the government. And so we've got this amazing database of all the historical work that's in the public domain. And it's, it's just an incredible resource for um, people to tap into and, and avoid duplicating work. Yeah. Um, you know, in Australia, a similar system. And they're, they're sort of punching along with us. And then the geological surveys. So, you know, we've got these provincial uh, national geological surveys putting out really high quality uh, pre-competitive data sets that are available usually for free. Um, and, and then research organizations like, you know, uh, the Mineral Exploration Research Center and, and other universities. Yeah. 
And so I think all of that together is really the reason that we were able to develop our own domestic uh, uh, sector to a point where it had such strength that we could then start exporting that. And um, you know, I think it's worth it's worth considering what the leading indicators are for that. And and I think it's worth it's worth protecting and having policies that in, that encourage that. Um, yeah, just interrupt me if you got any questions. I'll just keep I'll just keep droning on here. Um, then, uh, yeah, so this is, this is the sort of a similar breakdown. This is Natural Resources Canada data going back to 1946. This is a similar breakdown by province. And, you know, some interesting trends. You can see New Brunswick spiking in the early 50s. That's got to be uh, uh, Bathurst. Then, um, then Manitoba really spiking after that, which is... Um, you know, that's, that's discovery of Thompson and, and Flynn Flon. Um, and then, and then BC really taken off. Um, Saskatchewan, I suspect that's uh, uranium during the energy, energy uh, issues in the seventies. Um, and then Northwest Territories, diamonds split off of none of it. Um, Newfoundland, that'd be Boise's Bay, I assume. Um, and this is kind of an interesting one because this is, this is when I was in the Yukon. There was $8 million of exploration in the territory the year I got my first job. Yeah. Um, I think I might have been the only one that was employed. <laughs> yeah, a lot has changed since then, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then Sean Ryan, you know, discovered uh, uh, gold in the White Gold District with... Um, uh, underworld resources and like that led to a phenomenal increase in exploration investment and they they've sustained pretty consistently like a couple hundred million a year of investment in the territory now so it shows the shows the power of having that prospector early stage exploration activity happening and just just what it can what it can rush yeah 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 and, and then lots following afterwards like you you, you get coffee and, and others being discovered yeah exactly that. exactly and once 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 some of those go into production i mean and there's a mill there then who knows what else well i guess they'll do uh they'll do uh leach first but um, what's interesting you know, yeah what's who else interesting becomes, becomes viable after that right who knows yeah exactly and then um, ontario and quebec have obviously been the powerhouse for ever and it's kind of neat from starting in the late seventies, you can really see a trend of Ontario picking up a lot of market share and it's, it's more or less continuing. Um, and then, and then, but I think, you know, it has sort of flattened out since the peak of the last cycle. And remember this is percentage relative to other provinces. Um, but what you've seen in the last 10 years is Quebec really expanding really aggressively compared to Ontario. And you know, I think I think that's worth um, worth considering. This is uh, another view of it. Um, so if you if you if you go back just just one second, uh, so one thing uh, that kind of reminds me of so the first speakers in January they were actually uh, a few guys prospecting up in Northwest ter uh, Territories, and they picked up a huge you know gold land package in uh, there, and this kind of struck me there that there was a bit of an exploration boom there in the in the 90s but i guess the last 20 years there really hasn't been much exploration in the northwest territories even though obviously the geology is very similar to the surrounding provinces that have been very successful so kind of highlights some of these and then manitoba the other one as well that seems to have a pretty small share but uh uh, obviously, geology is is phenomenal there too, and I mean, you, you guys could, talk, sorry, from Exaro's experience, you can you can talk about that too. But uh, just some of these provinces that seem to be a little bit overlooked, and um, you know, it might be some of the places to to go to. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, yeah. Uh, well, Manitoba is a good one, so thanks for the prompt. Um, <laughs> so, so for for those. Uh, you know, we Exiro has spun out a, 
a, a gold company called Willison Metals, which has four um, gold properties in the Lynn Lake region of Manitoba. And, and part of what we've looked at in that area is that Manitoba has been dominated by uh, base metal uh, producers, uh, most of whom had very geo, you know, historically had very geophysically driven exploration methodologies. So you've got um, Sherrick Gordon, which was a nickel and, a, and then a, a lead, or sorry, copper zinc company. Um, you've got uh, HUD Bay, you know, and, um, and then of course in Thompson, you have Inco and then Valley. And, you know, and between the three of them, I think they, they controlled most of the uh, belts in Manitoba for, for, you know, most of the period on this chart. And, um, and, and, but what's interesting is there's these protozoic greenstone belts that have never really been systematically explored for gold. And, and then, you know, one of the, one of the things we look at is you can juxtapose that against, you know, I think five of the top eight, something like that, um, uh, largest gold producers in the world are in protozoic greenstone belts. Yeah. So you've got this almost untapped uh, surf space in Manitoba, which is, uh, it's kind of neat. Um, but I, I didn't really want to just talk my own book here, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is looking at Ontario and Quebec here. And, and <clears throat> what's kind of interesting is this is only junior exploration investment. So if you look at total expenditure, the two provinces are about the same. And Ontario is actually um, a little bit ahead of Quebec, I think, in most years. But if you look at uh, junior mining companies, which are mostly doing earlier stage exploration, there's a pretty clear trend here where up until uh, 2012, Ontario had quite a lead on Quebec in terms of um, in attracting investment. And then, and then um, basically ever since Quebec has taken a commanding lead and, you know, it's, these are not rounding errors, that's substantial. So now there's basically twice as much uh, junior mining company activity in Quebec as in Ontario. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, so why is a good question, I think. Um, uh, you know, I think there's, there's a suite of government incentives to stimulate exploration in Quebec. So you've got really aggressive uh, mineral exploration tax credit with, with the flow through shares. Um, there's a rebate program if you're spending hard dollars. Yeah. There's CIDEX, which is like a, a, um, a government-backed investment fund that actually directly invests in exploration. There's, there's SOQLIM, which is a government-owned exploration company. Yeah. Um, yeah you're so working in Quebec and you've got lots of experience in Ontario. So I'm interested in what you think. Yeah, no, exactly those reasons. Um, I mean, I would list some others like, I think the, you know, the online staking was, was available sooner in Quebec, which I think must have attracted a lot of uh, activity, obviously much easier to stake ground than if you have to go out physically. And I mean, from our experience, yeah, just communities are very uh, receptive of, you know, the Aboriginal communities. Uh, the whole consultation is much more uh, transparent than I guess already, much more, much, well, much better established, I guess, uh, for exploration. Um, the infrastructure obviously is, is quite a bit better in Northern Quebec. So, so some of those factors uh, must be pretty important too, because I mean, just like we saw with the provinces, some of the less accessible provinces like Nunavut, Northwest Territories are still, you know, getting a smaller share of the exploration. It must be just, just like that also in Ontario and Quebec, like the access has, has a lot to do with it, right? Like how, how well you can access the Northern parts of these provinces uh, and explore them. Because I mean, in, in, in Northern Quebec, all the way up to Raglan, but you know, the whole Eleanor, James Bay area is, is very much opened up with, with roads due to the hydro projects back in the 70s. So um, there's a lot of exploration and mining activity up there where in comparison on the Ontario side, it's, uh, I mean, you have a few centers like, you know, Muscle White and, 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 and uh, Anawapiskat and whatnot exploring, but, you know, Ring of Fire, but those are kind of isolated areas that are, I guess, just kind of floating there. 
Yeah, yeah it, it's pretty expensive to explore in those areas. Having road access makes a big difference. <laughs> yeah. I think Ryan is on the call here as well, Ryan Weston. So yeah, again, the road, road is everything when it comes to exploration. But yeah, I, I think those incentives is actually exactly what you were talking about. The, just the involvement of the government and yeah, funding exploration, having a, having a, even an exploration company, like you said, you know, Soquem actually exploring and forming a lot of JVs with, with junior explorers and uh, Sidex very involved in early stage exploration. So smaller investments, but a lot of, a lot of smaller juniors are, are getting funded by that. There seems to be really strong support for like the Northern universities and you, you were telling me about the research consortium that's there as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's the, the consortium, which is a consortium of uh, mineral exploration companies, academia and, and government. And you have to pay to become a member of that. And then there's yearly, you know, there's a lot of, basically res it, it's funding research that's very applicable to mineral exploration. So there, every, every partner company has a couple of representatives that get together and they propose programs or research projects to work on. And those are being fund, the research is being funded through the, through the annual, you know, the membership fees. So again, it's a, and, it, and there's, the, the companies range from, you know, there's smaller companies uh, and all the way up to Igneco and Glencore is part of it. And, and uh, it's, you know, it's a very dynamic, uh, good research group, so. Yeah. I, you know, what's, what's you know, clear though, is that the, ge the geology is that, almost the same in both provinces. Same thing, yeah. yeah. And so one of the, uh, I think one of the things that Zara has been able to take advantage of, for example, is we, we've got a lot of claims in Ontario and, and we were able to do a lot of that map staking when that started um, because there wasn't a lot of focus in Ontario at the time. It's, I think it's changed a bit now and we'll see if the expiration numbers come up, but yeah. Um, yeah, globally, they're both still great places to work, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. So th this, is, uh, this, is, this is a narrative that's sort of in the industry right now, which um, we, we talk a lot about when we're um, doing our corporate pitch. And it's this whole idea about declining discovery rates. And, you know, there is, there's people that track these kinds of, kinds of things. And there is some hand wringing about you know, are we getting, are we just not as good at finding uh, deposits anymore? Um, is, you know, is it because, you know, we're having to go deeper undercover, um, you know, have all the easy ones been found? That's a phrase that you kind of hear. And, and, you know, one of the things I did in my MBA is I went, I, I, and I'll show some of this, but I looked at expiration uh, success rates and kind of through all the available literature and um, uh, Agricola's engineering textbook in the 1500s, in that he's complaining that basically that all the easy ones have been found and that expiration is difficult. So that's, you know, it's, um, you know, uh, Richard Shoddy points out something that I think is pretty important here. And it's, there's a real lag time um, when you're, you know, because, you know, there's some of the gold mines in Timmins, for example, you know, they operated for, 80 years and they only ever had a five-year mine life and so you know who knows how big a discovery is until much much later and and whether it's significant so um and doug this next plot i got this was uh basically i think that the answer to this is that it's been ever thus there never was any easy ones um exploration is a tough game but uh this was a slide that doug silver had at the pdac this year um it was an excellent one because he showed similar plots from back in 2000 and then also in 1986. And there's actually a paper in 80, in uh, 77 that I, I know of too, that makes the same arguments. And basically it's just, it's always been the case. Um, we've been running out of discoveries and, and we've been getting worse at expiration. And then as time passes, you realize that some of those, that some of those were significant. So I, I actually think that's a bit of a red herring that we maybe shouldn't focus on too much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree. But this is this is interesting though, where uh, there is you know increasing discovery costs, and um, 
you know, so the average global discovery cost. And so this includes all the losers too, right? This includes companies that are spending money on exploration slash touring around doing IR and not actually doing exploration. And it includes the best of the best that are bringing the average up. So um, this is the whole industry and it basically costs the, you know, mankind three cents a pound to find new copper. This is all categories and uh, three cents a pound for zinc and lead. Um, these are, these are us numbers. So $45 an ounce, about $50 an ounce Canadian to find an ounce of gold. That's on average. I think the, the better companies are sort of $25 or less really. Um, but when you look at the entire industry, it's about $45 an ounce and, and then 28 cents a pound nickel. And a couple of interesting things here is, um, you know, nickel, the metal price for nickel is only about two times the price of copper, but it costs 10 times to find nickel, sulfide, sulfide nickel. So that's kind of interesting. And you, you can't help but think that's going to eventually play out somehow yeah. in, in uh, the economics of things. Yeah, well, and it has a lot to do with the geology of how it occurs, right? Like uh, copper obviously forms much bigger, larger systems, and there's more of them together clustered. The nickel is a bit more, uh, a bit more unique and geologically more clustered, yeah, and more more separated into sort of isolated bodies. It, yeah, yeah, it's, there's they're physically smaller deposits, and yeah, yeah. Um, um, I wonder some of these, uh, so again, how much of these is, are a little bit biased by the fact that the last few years, you know, we probably already have the spending numbers, but, but we don't necessarily have the realized discoveries. Um, the discoveries aren't realized yet in the resource numbers, right? Because you make a discovery and it takes whatever, two, three, four years to drill it off and actually come up with your maiden resource estimate. So um but yeah i mean either way there's definitely an increase in trend that's well I, I think that's definitely part of it and also um you know when when the industry gets busy partly for some of the reasons we'll explain later everything gets super expensive yeah and so you know in 2011 yeah i mean it was drilling costs were through the roof for example and and people's you know salaries and stuff so just to retain people so that's that's a significant piece too, but also the lag, like you mentioned. Um, but one of the one of the other things is if you look at uh, um, you can look at this in terms of percentage of the metal price, though. And I, I I don't have the plots for that, but you know if you look at gold back in say two thousand with a discovery cost of maybe two hundred twenty dollars, and the gold price was around two hundred or so, right? Um, so then, so the discovery cost was about a 10th, the price of gold. Yeah. Right. And whereas right now, $45 of say 1750 is more like two and a half percent. So if you look at it per ounce, it's actually cheaper. Yeah. Which is anyways, mm -hmm. kind of neat. So we should be doing more of it because it's, <laughs> it's worth it now. Yeah. Um, and then this is, you know, this, this, this is kind of significant and, um, you know, grades are, grades have really been declining, you know, and I think this is partly because you're seeing, you know, much larger scale projects and, and technology improvements for moving just huge amounts of, of rock. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's an important trend, but, I, but I also think it probably relates to the fact that um, which, which I'll show later is uh, less investment in early stage exploration. So that we're really just um, expanding known deposits and getting into lower grade halos rather than finding new ones. And then, and then this kind of shows the same thing for copper. This, this shows the uh, grade of copper declining and it's pretty much a straight line. Um, but then this is kind of an alarming trend. This is the uh, this is the the development time from discovery to production in in years. So going from you know less than ten years 
up to 30 or 40 years, hmm. which is, you know, it's not like you can just flip a switch on and all of a sudden the metals that you need are there. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. We can, we'll get into that. Um, and then this, this, I think is one of the biggest, one of the most important uh, plots in the whole thing that I'm talking about right now, I think. And there's really been, you know, this goes back almost 25 years. This problem, this trend probably goes back 40 or 50 years. It's almost a straight line of declining early stage expiration. Uh, so you have this decade long trend of underinvestment in the project pipeline. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, there's a lot of the major mining companies um, disassembled their, their corporate exploration departments um, and, and kind of devolved that to the operational level. Um, the project pipeline is very empty. And the, you know, when you look at, well, you know, like you and I, before we, before we, you know, Walbridge acquired Fenelon, we looked at almost 200 projects across Canada that were quote advanced stage. And none of them were anywhere close to being viable projects, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's, it's there, 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 we need new projects to be found and brought in and the producers, I think this is one of the keys The producers are not going to be able to maintain their production profiles with their existing projects. They're not going to be able to do it. Um, never mind grow. They're not, and they're not going to be able to do it through M&A because they're not going to grow by just eating each other. Um, and so I think inevitably the, the producing companies are going to drive a swing towards expiration and, and because they're going to find that their cupboards are bare. And, and that's going to have to go quite a ways upstream to get into earlier stage um, stuff to find the really big discoveries. And I think we're already seeing that now, that, that trend's starting to pick up. But I, I personally think it's going to become manic at some point, which our industry is kind of known for swinging pretty hard one way or the, than the other. Yeah. But it's, um, yeah, so that, that puts a lot of the onus or opportunity on the juniors, I guess, because it's, uh, it's, it's going to be us juniors doing the brunt of that grassroots exploration, uh, most likely. It's not going to be the majors uh, necessarily uh, developing their teams again up and, and, and uh, starting up their exploration. So I guess recently we've seen a lot of this funding mechanism where the majors get involved in, in early stage projects at, at like uh, equity investment stage where they invest 10, 20 percent into a company and so they let the juniors do the grassroots exploration, but they're still involved and they, they provide the, the funding. They just don't do it themselves, right? Some of them still do it, right? Some of them yeah. still have, 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 you know, I think in Canada, uh, probably Agnico is a great example, oh, right? Yeah, they're, they, they're the they really kept the faith on exploration. They also, one of my other points is we see a similar lack of investment in the people pipeline. <laughs> yeah. To the point where you and I are old guys now, which is ridiculous. And uh, um, but but you know Agnico, they've got. I think they're they're an example of a group that's done really well, and they 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 kept uh, a commitment to doing exploration right through you know 2014, 15, and so on, and had a lot of success with it. They also have a, a strong internal pipeline of people, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, pretty good retention rate yeah they keep but bringing, bringing I, i'm not forward. sure and it, it kind of comes up in my next slide here but i'm not sure that juniors are the ones that are going to be able to address this and one of the big reasons is you know if you've got a, a 5 10 20 million dollar market cap company and you've got to spend one to two million on on investor relations to stay relevant in the marketplace um, you know, and you're spending that larger proportion of your total budget on just overheads like that, there's a scale issue there. And, and, then, and then the other thing that you see is that these juniors, especially the really small ones, you know, they, you have to have news flow when you're publicly traded. And so there's this pressure to get, you know, weekly, you know, every two weeks have a press release on something. And it drives companies to really be um, Shastri and I talk about, you know, nibbling away at the tail of the elephant instead of having courage to, to step out yeah. and really test the big ideas. Yeah, that's why you're saying, yeah, there's a lot of regurgitation of the same old projects, a lot of brownfields exploration rather than 
being bold and actually going out and doing large scale grassroots exploration. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's this plot here. So this is this is something I put together as as, um, as came out of the work I did for my MBA there. Um, but it's a pretty simple diagram. Uh, but there's a lot going on. So I just thought it's worth stepping through it a little bit. What I did is I took all of the MDI occurrences in Ontario. Um, there's about 19,000 of them. And, and you know, Ontario's classified them all by what stage of development they're at, whether it's a prospect or has a resource or, had, you know, is in production or has past production. Um, and then I had a couple other data points and I, I kind of, I wanted to get a, get the idea of like how many concepts turn into a profitable mine. You know, what's the success rate? And there's this number that gets kicked around, which is like one in 3000. And it actually works pretty beautifully. It, it's bang on. Um, and, uh, but so what I used as a, a proxy for sort of expiration concepts was just the number of mining claims in the province. That's probably more now. There's been a lot of staking since I did this. Um, and then there's a hundred, you know, there's uh, 19,000 occurrences. Uh, about 4,000 of those have had drilling on them. 3,000 of those have, um, you know, what, say a resource, what we'd call an historic resource now, at least, if not something more robust. Um, 2,600 of those uh, have gone into production at some point at, and, and to some level. And then I had another uh, talking point, which was from um, a talk that David Harkwell had given at a, a luncheon at Roundup about 10 years ago and it just stuck in my head. And he said that, um, you know, and, and Franco Nevada reviews a lot of projects, obviously. And uh, he said that, you know, they figure that about only one in 20 mines return the cost of capital to the owners. Hmm. With meaning, you know, they, the owners get the, the required return back to themselves, profitable, um, but, you know, in proportion to the risk that they took. And that's a that's a dreadful statistic, <laughs> but but you know, and then then when I plotted this up, you know what you can see is that so these this shows this part here shows you know how many of these got converted into the next stage, right? And then how many of these got converted into the next stage? And so when you look at projects that have been drilled, sixty nine percent of the projects that have been drilled have at some point had some kind of a, a resource estimate. Well, there's, that doesn't make any sense. Like a resource is supposed to have, um, you know, potential to be mined economically at some point in the future. That's the definition of it. And, and so what you, and then, and then 87% of those <laughs> have had some type of, you know, some of the historical stuff was small scale, but some type of production done on them. Mm -hmm. And that's just absurd. You know, and then and then and then of course you have this failure rate before you know to, to get a profitable operation. And so I think I think what this is showing is you're getting this overinvestment in these quote advanced stage things because this urgency to you know have some numbers that you can promote that you can put out a press release on, and then and then this risk aversion that really stops stops groups from really doing the exploration, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then, and then the lack of, a lack of investment in, you know, identifying new search spaces and doing that discovery stage exploration. Um, you know, and this is, this, this is a, you know, Ontario is a mature jur jurisdiction, you could say. And, uh, you know, so this is probably typical for a lot of, you know, uh, just sort of on average, if you look at distribution of metals and the way we go after things. And I think it really underlines the point that, you know, th these are long odds. And to be successful, you really got to have, a, you know, an all-star team that's really doing high quality work. And, you know, I think the, the smartest investors out there are really focused on backing the right people that are doing things properly and, and focusing on quality. And, and this model of grabbing a showing and promoting it because the prices went up, it's, it's usually value destructive. Um, yeah. The other thing I'd highlight here is these are, these are actually 15 year old statistics, but from concept to discovery, 
the average timeline is 14 years for base metals and 22 years for gold metal, gold gold projects. And then and then from discovery to production, um, the average at the time was 13 years for base metals and seven years for gold. So from from starting to say you know we need a new source of metals to having something that goes into production is 30 years. Wow. <laughs> Which is you know it's just got to catch up eventually. Um, yeah. So anyways, I kind of had fun putting that together. And then this was one of the one of the sources that I and I kind of stole this idea shamelessly from a Rio Tinto presentation. They referenced this paper. But this is kind of neat because this is looking at uh, research and development and new product development in, in uh, other sectors. Hmm. Um, so this is looking at new drugs or new chemical applications or, you know, that kind of thing. And, and what, the, what they did in this study is they tracked, um, they looked at the patent records and they did an analysis of sort of 3,000 randomly selected patents. And then they looked at... Um, uh, project reports from some of the, you know, very large, uh, like 3M, you know, that have uh, these, these large research and development teams that spend money on finding new uses for glue. And then, uh, um, and then venture capital records looking at uh, investments in, in new businesses at different stages. And what they found is that the curve for all of these three all overlap. This is, it's really neat. They all overlapped on the same on the same curve. So like exploration, they've got sort of raw ideas and then different stages of, of de-risking and then commercialization, developing, and then, and then launching a, a new product commercially. And then how many of those are successful? And when you look at the overall curve, it's one in 3000, it's very similar. Hmm. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of a neat little touch point, but it, there's also, I think, lessons that can be taken from some of those other sectors in and just how you manage that innovation process and, and um, um, that sort of applied research, if you will. Yeah, yeah. there's probably some, new, some, some newer literature on that, like uh, what's happening in the tech space, for example, is, is the ratio similar there as, as well or not? Like how many of the uh, social media or, or, or app ideas become a, become a Facebook or, a, or, or a WhatsApp or whatever? Well, one of the one of the terrifying things about the tech industry, because obviously for risk capital, we're competing against them for investment, right? Yeah. In in the mineral sector, and uh, is the timelines. So, Watch you know, we, we're taking thirty years mm -hmm. to get product online from from originally kind of dreaming that you might want to do it, and then meanwhile, you know, they can they can create a piece of software and you know maybe. Uh, a beta version in nine months that, or a year that's infinitely scalable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and you can test the market almost live as you're developing it. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, then, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and that's what we're up against. So that's why, you know, the investors are definitely getting their much more short term, you know, like, like they don't have a, a patience anymore. Right. So, uh, and, and that's why it's so difficult to explain investors nowadays is, is uh, yeah, you, we're not going to be able to find a tier one deposit in a year, you know, like it's, it, it takes many years to prove these things up. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's, that might be a place where we're missing out a little bit against the. But I, in the, you know, in the bigger picture though, and that's, that's kind of why I tried to make that point is the physical world still matters, right? Yeah. People still need those metals. And so it's, you know, it's a question of incentive pricing, I guess. And at a certain point, you know, it's, it's got to catch up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you could argue that, that, uh, yeah, like, like a lot of the social media stuff is quite fluff, you know, and it, it, it sort of comes and goes and there's, it's a bit fashionable, like, you know, one app is fashionable for a while and then it, it's, it's, but gold is always going to be fashionable, and you're always going to need copper. So, um, yeah, like you say, it's 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 a it's a better longer term investment, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, I think to be fair, some of the technology stuff has a lot of utility, like the fact that you can order something right now on Amazon and have it on your doorstep within hours. Really, is pretty amazing, and and for cheap too. But yeah, exactly. So, and then this this lot. This,
Well, this one is um, taken from a Rio Tinto presentation from, I think, 2007 or so. And it's really neat because they really articulate um, a business case for exploration. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I, I was looking at when I did my applied project with my MBA years ago was, you know, is there a economic value added business case for exploration that goes beyond just the promotional casino, right? And, and, um, and, and they really laid it out nicely in this presentation that Rio Tinto had done. And so what they did is over about a 10 year, 12 year period there, um, you know, they, they, well, I guess to back up, um, the way they look at a discovery is a project with an economic study on it that's then sold to the project team um, for development. And so that their definition of discovery still is actually quite a ways downstream already. Uh, it's not just a drill hole. It'd be like, like a PEA probably. Yeah. And then, um, um, so they, they're looking at an average of 10 years for a tier one discovery and then another 15 years to develop that. Um, and they, had a, they have a goal of, at the time, they had a goal of one tier one discovery a year, and they almost did that. And they were spending between, in that period, I think it was like 500 million plus a year on exploration. So they have the law of large numbers on their side. But um, when they look at how much they spent and then adjusted it for um, tier two projects, you know, in smaller projects that they sold, um, what they what they realized was that the net cost per discovery over that period for a tier one discovery was about $82 million. And that's to a point where there's an economic study. Um, and that sounds about right. You'd, you'd probably agree with the project you're working on. <laughs> and, um, and, then, and then they would sell this project internally to their project team. So they would actually recover the cost of that. And so they looked at expiration as a uh, sort of a, they, they articulated it like a cost neutral source of optionality. So it's, 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 it's exposure to, um, you know, the metals and, and the upside of, you know, having something expand further. And on average, it was almost free for them to generate that organically. Yeah, and what it requires is a very large budget so that you have the law of large numbers and then a very large, long time horizon so that you can average. So that's critical, obviously. Um, but then they com they also compared it over the same period to some of the high profile tier one um, acquisitions that were made in the industry. And so to acquire a project, it was like one to 10 billion, but to generate it organically internally with expiration is only 82 million. So it's pretty clear economic case to fund expiration. Um, it, it's interesting that it's often the first thing to go when yeah. companies, uh, you know, start having a hard time. Well, that's, yeah. So this, this, I always enjoyed this slide. I, I've seen this before and, and uh, no, I, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it speaks so much to uh, what's, what's really wrong with, with our industry is, but it, yeah, like, why, why don't uh, more majors understand this or, or realize this, right? And then I guess it comes down to, again, the sort of the lack of long-term thinking or strategic thinking, like companies don't necessarily think 10 years ahead or 15 years ahead. And and I guess the pressures of production at the time are, are much more rapid. So they need to, you know, when it's, when it's, and then you can kind of see that from the years of acquisition, right? Like all those acquisitions were made in 2007, eight, nine, when, when things were good. <laughs> so yeah, metal prices are high. And then, woo, let's let's uh, let's buy some some assets, and 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 they buy these assets at the at the top of the market. And um, now it would be interesting to see also how much of these got divested afterwards, right? And uh, from from those from the acquisitions, or written down completely. Well, written down, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's an interesting quirk of our industry that we're um, so reactive to the changing conditions. Yeah, yeah like the, the discoveries take a lot of time, but still the thinking 
is, is, is very short term usually and, and uh, very few companies think in the long term. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the things that this, you know, things that are very long term and, and also potentially things that are high risk, like basic research, that, that seems like maybe that's a domain where it's appropriate for um, the public sector to support it. Yeah. You know, yeah, that kind of speaks you know, things to like yeah, infrastructure, exactly. basic research, you know, that those, those are often thought to be appropriate sort of uh, things for the public sector to dabble in. And so I've kind of thought about this a little bit in terms of like, before this, you have that government geology survey, you know, which, you know, because some of this data that this starts with might have been published by the government survey 30 years before that. Yeah. You know, and then even, even before that, you have the research organizations like universities and that they're coming so, up with, yeah, that's interesting. Coming up so, with ideas. Yeah. And so you have this whole chain of activities, but there's a bit of a market failure where the industry is not really adequately addressing that early stage exploration piece. And I think that's why that those, uh, um, those incentive programs, you know, yeah. like, like, like you see in a very strong way in Quebec are, are almost critical to just for the, the long-term sustainability of the sector, you know? Yeah, that's a very interesting argument. Yeah, so that, to, to help the companies to make this time to discovery shorter is, is, is uh, if the geological surveys, the government can do more of this legwork, more of this early stage exploration, basically creating free airborne mag surveys and, and gravity surveys and geo, you know till sampling and all that stuff, making it available for companies so that they don't have to spend three four years gathering all that data and millions of dollars they can already take advantage of that and maybe make the discovery time frame shorter right yeah exactly i think one of the other things that i think would be great is uh incentive to have people actually out on the ground to doing like boot and hammer work because so much of the work now is sitting at a computer right and playing with data existing data rolling it over, looking at it different ways. And, and so I think incentives to get people out physically on the ground, looking at the rocks, making new observations, finding new things. I think that's a, a, a big opportunity for, for uh, you know, like prospector grants or other incentives to have companies doing that type of work, not just drilling things that were already killed in each of the last four cycles. <laughs> yeah well that's a good plot to actually the the opa ontario there is there's that uh, uh we're working on it in, incentive available apparently and also the well, geological surveys have also incentives like that too yeah 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 one of the ones we had in ontario was they actually were giving double assessment credits for that type of work which is, yeah. which was you know it's a, it's a good start well, and, and, and the, again, the guys that were at Northwest Territories, uh, those prospectors that gave the talk in January, you know, they were telling us about the, the government grants that are available there. Uh, you know, they raised, uh, I forget the number now, but a couple of hundred thousand dollars, I think, among, you know, in a group of them uh, yeah. from these government grants to go out and, and stake ground and prospect. I think if it's set up properly, that's, I think that can be phenomenally effective. You know, and who knows? I mean, it might not lead to a discovery directly, but now you have a team of, you know, those fellows, a team of like really qualified guys that have gotten their head into the geology in that region and are enthusiastic about it. And who knows what that leads to? So, yeah. Okay. So, this is um, second to last slide here. And it just sort of to summarize these things. And, um, you know, it's, we're in the middle of kind of convert these, these trends that are converging. So we've got a decades long underinvestment trend of underinvestment in people. And I, I think this is extremely positive for young people that are coming into the, their careers right now. Um, we have uh, baby boomers are, are stepping backwards. There's really very, virtually no one in the industry between say, you know, I'm 43 and say 60. Um, very, very few people. And there's even quite a gap between me and, and then, you know, there's quite a number of people in their 20s and early 30s. 
And um, I, I think that the industry is basically going to be desperate for people for, for a long time. Um, then there's decades long underinvestment in the project pipeline, which we talked about, um, increasing discovery costs, increasing discovery development timelines, in, you know, and this is part of that, increasing social license requirements. So there's just this, you know, legitimate demand by society to say, well, you know, you guys got to do this in a way so that it's worth it for us too and everybody um, in the long run. Um, global infrastructure deficits, we didn't, we talked about that a bit. Um, you know, you've got this whole trend towards, which it probably will reflect it in an infrastructure spending boom towards um, moving the energy economy off of carbon. Um, We've got normal sort of late economic cycle and inflation driven increase in, uh, in hard assets and metal prices. Um, we didn't get into this, but there's strategic pressures with emerging new world power like China. It's obviously, a, you know, um, China having an economy that exceeds the US's economy in the next 10 or 15 years. Like that's, a, that's an earth shaking change of circumstances that you're gonna see implications in every facet of our lives, I think. <laughs> and then the global pandemic in the last year. But, you know, all of these things, I think, are converging to a point where, um, you know, I think it's very positive for the mineral exploration sector. Yeah. Um, and this this was a plot from when I um, Shastri and I sort of joined Exiro full-time to start building it. And... Um, that's three years ago now, and I think I think our timing was pretty good, and we're we're seeing these things start to be realized now. And then I think the last slide I just wanted to leave everyone with is this picture, which I, I I've used before, but this is a shot of the Bingham copper mine in Utah. It's a monster. It used to be a mountain, now it's a valley, and you can see the weather's different from the surface down to the bottom, <laughs> and and you know. You can't even see this. This is this is probably like you know one of the biggest kind of dump trucks imaginable, and it just is this tiny speck down at the bottom there. And th the reason that I put this up here is the amount of copper that's come out of this hole in the ground is approximately the same amount that the globe consumes every year. Yeah. And so you just imagine, like you know, where's Where's next year's hole going to be? <laughs> yeah, we need to find one of these every year, basically. Yeah, pretty much. So yeah. it just shows the scale of of yeah. uh, of what's required. So, anyways, those are the yeah. slides that I had on that. That's good. Yeah, can you give us a quick overview of, of you know what is Xyro doing then to take advantage, I guess, of these trends and and, and the opportunities that you're seeing. So what, yeah, that went a bit longer than I expected, but I hope it was interesting. So Xyra, we're, we're a private exploration company. Um, I can show a couple quick slides, maybe. We're a private exploration company. Um, we've managed to uh, be uh, fairly well funded. Um, and we were working on projects. You know, one of the unique things that we're doing is collecting old historic paper um, exploration data sets. I'm just trying to find... So I can share it. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So yeah, we're a private exploration company. We're trying to take a very long-term approach. Um, we're, we're values driven. Um, you know, when I, when Shastri and I first joined full time, we basically spent two days brainstorming, you know, what kind of company did we want this to be? What are our values? Um, you know, what kind of DNA do we want to put on this company? And we came up and, and we had, I think like three whiteboards of things that we condensed into four things. And, you know, unconventional thinking, we're all pretty creative people. Um, and that's, uh, you know, across all dimensions. Technical excellence, that's really important to all of us. Business discipline, you know, any decisions have to be driven by what makes sense in terms of adding economic value. And courageous leadership, which is really, you know, shows up in a lot of ways around you know, from people speaking up at the right time to, you know, making a decision to just do things properly and not what's expedient and, uh, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's part of it. 
Um, we've got a very strong shareholder list. So, you know, management and board is about 30%. With our friends and family, we're at pretty much 50% of the company. Um, our, our largest shareholders are resource capital funds, Haywood Securities, um, Sprott USA, and Dundee Corporation. Um, we've gotten, uh, we've managed to raise 6.7 million over the last seven years, most of that in the last three years since we've been full time. And um, yeah, and then, and then we've been able to build just a fantastic team of people. So Shastri and I, um, Sydney and Kylie are, 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 are two primary geologists that are working with us and they're, they're excellent. They're based here in Sudbury. Um, Gord Morrison works with us a lot, and I think a lot of people uh, on the call would be, be familiar with him, and, and Catherine is our, our chair, and of course, Catherine and, and Shastri and Gord and Sid were all part of the success team of FNX Mining, which everyone in Sudbury would be familiar with. Um, David Elliott's on our board, uh, Nadine Kerr is on our board, Stephanie Hart joined us a year ago to be a uh, a CFO and she was previously head of finance with Valley. We were super lucky to attract her. And then we've got this team in Mexico that we've uh, built. We've got a facility down there where we've scanned over 4,000 boxes and map tubes of old records and they're still working away and they're starting to work on uh, um, digitizing and, and bringing uh, vectorizing data and bringing it into compilations. So that's a that's an excellent opportunity. They're all, they're almost all geologists, um, young energetic geologists. It's based in Hermosillo, and then we've got some uh, contract geos working with us, like Rob Jones works with us um, on a lot of our field programs and that kind of thing. So we've really focused on team and 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 quality investors, and you know um, collecting this proprietary data. You know, we found some phenomenal stuff in the proprietary data, like intersections, you know, 1.7 copper over 180 feet. As far as we can tell, it's not been followed up. And, you know, it's one of the, one of the projects that we're looking at and digging into. Um, we found an historic nickel resource in the U.S. that we've acquired, and, and uh, we're working on bringing a partner into it. We've got a couple of very large gold projects that we've consolidated in Ontario. We've attracted a major to one of those that's spending um, you know, about $2 million this year on it and, uh, and, and could spend more aggressively over the next couple of years. Um, one of our projects we staked was the North Spirit Greenstone Belt, which is north of Red Lake. So we staked about, uh, it was 1,500 units covering over 300 square kilometers. And we're putting together a compilation on that right now. Um, and then uh, the, one of the other key assets we're working on is we, part of our team spent two years, Sydney spent two years looking at uh, copper in the southwest of North America. And we started right at the crustal scale and, and brought it up to the you know property scale and incorporated our proprietary data. And so we've got two copper projects in, uh, in Western Nevada that we've acquired. And, and we're working on, and we think um, one is an historic resource, and we see sort of tier one discovery potential for copper on those. And there's lots of other things that we're working on. So we, we figure that the, the sunk exploration costs in our paper data probably represents about $10 billion of, of past work. So, you know, I, I didn't really want to do a commercial for Exiro, but, um, you know, I'll just, I'll just say maybe that, you know, if there's anyone that has collections of old paper data, you know, we're, we're often interested in uh, open to scanning that material for free, basically, in exchange for a copy. Um, if you have projects that you'd like someone to take a look at and possibly option from you, we're interested in having a look at those. And uh, if you're looking for projects, we have some, some really, um, you know, good exploration opportunities that we've packaged that we're looking for partners on also. So that's the corporate piece. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> no, that, was, that was awesome. Yeah. I guess uh, people can, uh, I know there's a, there's a couple talks, I guess, publicly available on YouTube, I guess, where they can find out more about Xyro minerals. Yeah. And um, maybe we can give a plug also to your first, Spin, uh, spin out company that you created, uh, Wilson Metals, right? 
Yeah, Williston Metals. They have a website, independent board management team, and they're uh, they're working on going public. Yeah. yeah, and so that's the that's the project that just just to kind of loop back to the presentation you gave two years ago. So that was that was the presentation uh, that was the project that you talked about quite a bit back then, uh, and and you know since then you've done successful exploration on it uh, and and we're able to spin it out and send it on its own. <laughs> yeah, we managed to um, we managed to attract a, a really good management team. So Felix Lee, who's a past, yeah. just recently the past president of the PDAC, he's the CEO. Um, Stephanie uh, is a shared CFO position, so she's the CFO there also. Ian Trinder joined Felix as a VP Exploration, and Shastri is the chair of the company. And Shastri is from Manitoba, so there's a lot of there's a lot of ties there. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for your time, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Yeah. Well. we'll so what can we look forward to, Josh? So this year, I know you're, you're pretty busy. I, I think you got a, quite a bit of field work coming up and uh, working. We're doing a lot of field work. Um, we're, um, I think we're very close to actually having partners on a couple of our other large packages too. There's lots of good discussions. And um, pretty soon we're gonna have to turn to finding the next projects to start putting together too, so. Yeah. Well, I wish you all the fun. Wish you all the best, and uh, yeah, things are pretty challenging now, right now. But uh, yeah, you can manage the, pulling off a good field program safely, and yeah, have have a good summer. Yeah, and uh, yeah, wish wish everybody else uh, a good time. So next month, uh, we already have speakers lined up. There will be uh, Magna Minerals, who will be talking about their. Shakespeare project uh, and some other projects, and you know, mainly looking for for PGEs, nickel copper PGEs in the Sunday area. Um, so that will be in a, in a month from now. So again, thanks, Josh, for for joining. Thanks, Stella. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Take care. All the best. Bye. -bye.